Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. And today, I want to take you all on a journey through the fascinating world of technology and its impact on all of our lives. And of course, I'm your host, Neil C. Hughes. And today, I've got the privilege of speaking with the CEO and co-founder of AppsFlyer, which is a global mobile marketing measurement and experience platform trusted by over 12,000 brands, including the likes of Coca-Cola, HBO, Walmart, eBay, and the list goes on and on. And as a result, AppsFlyer has become a game changer in the mobile ecosystem since its inception way back in 2011. So in today's episode, we're going to explore how AppsFlyer became a Series D unicorn with a valuation of over $2 billion and how it's impacted the mobile ecosystem by providing crucial campaign analytics and attribution. And in a mobile first world, I want to learn more about the future of mobile measurements and the delicate relationship between privacy and user experience in the digital age. And as we dive deeper into the conversation today, I'm hoping we'll also find time to discuss the importance of accurate data for effective decision making and the impact that privacy changes and regulations in that digital ecosystem are going to have on the industry and how AppsFlyer is leveraging cutting edge privacy preserving technology to ensure data analytics and insights are both powerful and secure. So buckle up and hold on tight because today I'm going to beam your ears all the way to Israel where today's guest is waiting to speak with us. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about yourself, your background and your journey into launching AppsFlyer? Good afternoon, Neil. That's a big question. So I would say that my background is software engineering. I was born mid-70s, believe it or not. And I think that when I was six, I had my first computer. It wasn't really a computer. It was a gaming console and some program. It wasn't even basic. It was something else. And I uh, and I just, a couple of days ago, I just remembered that my, one of the first software that they built, again, it was probably in the very early 80s, probably in 1980, drawing a circuit on the screen. And it connects to the home television, and you had to draw a pixel, and you take the radius, and you do the calculation around it, and you draw pixel by pixel. And I still remember that was one of the first programs that I wrote, and I was mind-blowing. And then I was just, I just continued to have all my childhood around computers and then IBMs and then personal computers and stuff like that. I, I think that all my use life, I was around that. I had the BBS before the internet. I didn't know it was the internet, but I didn't know what's the BBS probably. And now uh, the population getting older, my uh, at least my age, uh, but don't know what BBS is. And BBS is basically allowing you to dial in to another computer. It uses kind of the fax protocol, and instead of www, you have the phone number. Yeah. So you dial in the phone number, you connect to the other PC, and that's magical. Well, why it's magical? Uh, because the experience is almost one-to-one. So you have a website that can serve only one user at a time. So if you have more phone lines, you can serve more. So I had one, and then I had another one. But anyways, you have a really personal relationship with the ones that actually dial into the to the BBS. You talk with them, you chat with them, you develop a relationship. Yeah, I remember that my mom uh, once said, told me, hey, why no one is calling us? I mean, I'm waiting for a phone call from my mom. And I'm like, yeah, the computer is using it. So and then we added more phone line and not a phone line. So again, my and then I started to, to study computer science, the technical, and then I moved more into the business world. I did. I started an MBA here in Israel. And one of the reasons that I started this program because they had the kind of an exchange program with the Wharton Business School. Yeah. And I told them, look, I think it's, it's a very nice program. They said, look, we select only one or two students out of the entire class, which is 150 students. I'm like, you know what? 1% odd oh, is good. It's good for me. So I'll go for it. So and it did work. So I did was elected for the exchange program. It was an amazing opportunity for me to study at Wharton Business School with amazing people. It was really mind blowing. But I was also fortunate to find a summer internship in a local DC in Philadelphia. 
And over there, I studied, studied searched analytics, specifically around applications and mobile, and marketing, advertising, and digital ecosystem in general. And I found like really big issues and challenges in, in this market. First of all, I have no doubt that this is the mobile devices, mobile devices as we know it, really are going to change everything about everything. I still remember that was mind blowing. I just really, I had very little sleep during these days. Out of excitement, the potential of these new devices and specifically applications. And I also saw a gold rush. I, I think that it was a gold rush, the formation of a gold rush. It was really kind of 2010, it was really the initial signals that mobile, specifically the app stores, are going to change everything. Just to remind you, 2007, the introduction of the iPhone, 2008, the introduction of the app store. A year after, you had 500 apps. I remember back then, as his respectable VC said, hey, we're never going to invest in app business. It's not really a business. I thought differently, and I thought that applications, specifically mobile and applications, are going to change everything and going to grow exponentially in the coming years. I also thought that there was a lot of conflicting interest, me coming in as an engineer into an ecosystem that had, I knew nothing about the internet. So I was working in Intel, Semiconductor, and the circuit simulation software and stuff like that. And I had nothing to do with the internet back then. But I saw a lot of conflicting interests was researching a market and companies been optimizing campaigns. And I'm like, you optimizing to who? To the buyers, to the sellers? Are you optimizing your own bank account? And I thought, how far can a vision of any company can go if the vision is to increase their its own bank account? They're not trying to really move the needle for, for an ecosystem and really increase the benefit of everybody. So, and then I looked at the technological part uh, mobile applications specifically with the lack of cookies. So in native applications, you don't have cookies. It's really fun, sound familiar now with cookies deprecation and all that. So that was 2010 and 11. No cookies, companies couldn't measure anything and they've been guessing, but it was okay for them because that was the gold rush. With the gold rush, you're just digging for gold. You're not being too sophisticated about it, right? And then it just didn't make sense to me is with the engineer mindset that Someone need to solve it. Someone need to solve measurement. Someone need to solve analytics. So companies and people can make decisions that make sense to them. And this is how basically the idea or uh, what we do today came from. And uh, specifically also, I was looking at a uh, starting company in a market that is going to continue to grow like crazy. And that one, that is, this is one. Second thing is, I thought that if we are going to be independent and unbiased, and we're not going to have conflicting interests. Probably we're going to find a lot of things to solve in the ecosystem. And that was, that was, that was the beginning. I also thought that someone must solve it. So it, when I came back to Israel and I was speaking to Reshef and Reshef, I know him from before high school when we were kids, he was one of the users. I gave him admin right in the BBS. So I told him about my experience and, and we just thought it to develop the technology to do that. That's the beginning. And basically this is what we're doing today, 11, more than 11 years after. Wow, an incredible journey you've been on. And like you said, it was a magical period in the world of technology. We must be of a similar age because around that time I had, a, I think it was a computer with 16K RAM. I mean, 16K RAM, it's unbelievable to mention that in this day and age, but I don't know, the imagination that we had back then and to create things with just using 16K RAM is just phenomenal. Now, I'm conscious we will have people listening and they hear about that. Is, by the way, for 16A, a case that you didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> you can never reach the cat. It's like infinite. <laughs> oh, but and we will have people listening hearing about Apps Flyer for the first time. So uh, how would you describe Apps Flyer to somebody listening? We built a unique technology to allow brands consumer-based companies to understand where the users are coming from, where the customers are coming from, so they can make better decisions that make sense to their own users. Using this technology, you can reach automatically a marketplace of 10,000 10, different partners 
So we have integrated and built into the product uh, access to Meta, Google, Snapchat, TikTok, all the networks of the world, all the marketing clouds of the world, like Salesforce, Adobe, Oracle. So you basically have some kind of measurement, leading measurement and attribution technology for mobile applications, but also kind of a single source of truth that companies can leverage their data with other partners and technology partners and analytics partners, marketing cloud partners. We also have a bunch of other products for engagement, like deep linking and smart partners, and basically helping consumer-based companies to, to turn their website visitors into users, into app users. That's really in a nutshell. But I would just think is that created this magic is really unique measurement technology that we've created. And then back then we managed to build a network around it with all these amazing companies. And I think that being independent and a non-biased measurement company, we've created and gained a lot of trust between buyers and sellers, marketers and publishers. We have probably 60 to 70% of the largest brands and consumer brands that e they have on application use our software and use our technology to basically get the analytics and the marketing analytics so they can make the right decisions that make sense to them. That's basically it. And I think that what we have created in terms of the marketplace and the mindset that we have in building new technology is to satisfy a very simple question, are we uniquely positioned to build? Because if not, it should be built by the market, by the ecosystem. So we just sort of need to open new APIs or existing APIs and allow the market build it. I don't think, and I don't believe in competition of quality of engineers and stuff like that. I really believe in how to maximize innovation for the entire ecosystem. It also means that we say no to a lot of things along the way. So some of our direct competitors thought that it's a good business to start their own ad network and sell media. And we sell software. So we sell in the cents. Uh, but when you sell media, when you're selling advertising, you're selling the dollars. So immediately you can make a lot of money. Maybe it's a good business. And I believe that they thought it's a good business. We think that this is wrong business for us because it will really je jeopardize and risk our existence, will risk our naturality. It will risk our, the trust that we have with advertisers and marketers and the brands and the, the publishers like Facebook, like Google, like TikTok and Snapchat and all the, the other ad networks. Some companies thought that the data brokerage is a good business. Uh, we thought that this is more of a CRM. Now, if I discover that my CRM is taking my data and I don't know what they're doing with the data and maybe not my target, my data is working against me, it's probably going to be the last time I'm going to use that software. So we had that in mind and in every single thing that we've been doing and making decisions since 2011 and 12, and I think that it really went a lot, very long way. And I think it goes back to if you remove your internal conflict of interest with your own customers, you can, I think that this is a massive component for creativity and innovation. Maybe not you're going to be successful, but I think that this is a massive component and it's much more fun also. You have really clear vision what you want to do in the world. So yeah. As you said, the iPhone first came out in 2007, the App Store 2008. There were a lot of gimmicky apps back then, turning your, your phone into a chainsaw, a flute, drink beer, a torch, all those things. By 2010, things were starting to mature. I'm curious, what changes in the mobile industry did you anticipate before you actually founded AppsFly? We didn't anticipate anything. The assumption was very simple. Mobile is going to change everything and Everything in our lives. That's one. Yeah. Second thing is, I don't know how. I don't know which vertical. And obviously, I'm not going to gamble on specific vertical or let's say it's gaming on a specific game. I thought that it's going to be too risky. Yeah. But that's, yeah. it really reminded me the Levi story in the 19th century in the gold rush. Yeah. In the end of the day, Levi's came and built 
tools and tents and the clothing for the gold uh, figures, right? So, and here I thought that that endless amount of opportunities, endless. I'm not going even to predict the future this way or another. And I would let the market do that. But what we want to do is to provide the platform to allow all these companies to use our technology. And in reality, it worked really well. Because right now we have all developed because that you can imagine. We have services, streaming, dating, gaming, travel, banking, payments, and anything that you have globally. You have small companies and the largest companies on the planet use our technology. So I think that it really worked well for us. There's two bets. Bet on mobile, don't bet on vertical. We didn't bet on a specific region because we're truly global. Actually, the fact that we are global really helped us in, in, in many ways in that aspect because the world is really not equal in the way the world is adapting new technology. So what we've seen that the East adopting mobile technology much faster than the West. So what was kind of the standard in Asia or India or China and what they've been doing with mobile many years ago, becoming the standard of in the US right now, let's say payments uh, or e-commerce. We saw not too long ago, I think COVID really did a good service there, but not too long ago, we saw we have we have data that we do research for marketing purposes. We saw that in e-commerce and specifically grocery, let's say in India, I'm talking about five years ago, maybe six years yeah. ago, maybe even more, something like that. 90%, 95% of the transactions happen in the mobile app. In the US, only 15% happens on mobile and mobile app. The rest on desktop. They just, in the US, they just didn't do a lot of e-commerce transaction on their mobile phone. Now it completely changes. Yeah. Right? So what we've seen is how our customers are leveraging the technology and using mobile applications in the East. And we've built the software and technology and then the West and the e e e Europe and the US enjoy, but enjoy this new technology that we've developed basically in Asia. And also, truly speaking, Customers in Asia are very demanding. And that's great because they're not going to, they will save the nicety. They will tell you if your product is good. Maybe they're not going to tell you anything. But if something didn't work, they will be the first to know. They will be the one that will calling you and calling you. And you know what? If you're not going to do what they need, they're going to leave and go somewhere else. Yeah. And that was very challenging, but it was really good for us because it really, they demanded that we're going to be the best. It was our survival to be the best. And then when the market really evolved, it allowed companies, again, the largest companies in Europe and you know, consumer companies in Europe and the US to leverage our technology. It's really interesting because when we started the company, people said, hey, you're going all over the place. You're going to enterprise and small business. And we said, yes, we're going into after startup companies, small business and large business. Actually, we didn't really have a strategy, yeah. but it really felt the right thing to do. And I can tell you that now we figured out the strategy. The strategy was good. We didn't have the reasoning for the strategy. Now we see it because large companies, enterprise companies, highly regulated companies really push us for stability, for compliance, for privacy, for security. And smaller companies use the technology and APIs in a way that we didn't think about. So they really push us to build new stuff, to innovate. You're not going to get the bank and they will tell you, hey, why don't you develop this and that? Because they're really, they're here to learn from you. So everybody is a winner. Um, and also it's a really critical tool for marketers, specifically mobile marketers. If you think about, I don't know, finance industry, Bloomberg is the primary tool or Excel or whatever. For mobile marketers, 
apps flyer or analytics, that specific marketing analytics is the primary tool. They cannot do anything without it. Now we said to ourselves, if the, if we can create kind of a community that work with the tool, and they can be either the best sales and marketing or the worst sales and marketing for us, right? Yeah. From company to company. And we see, let's say banks, they want to level up their marketing and specifically on mobile, they hire from who? They hire from gaming companies. Yeah. And they come in and they want to work with the best tool that will allow them to do a great job and to become successful in their position. So we have tens of thousands of customers, people that use the software directly every single day. And we try to do the best we can for them specifically and obviously for their companies and their consumer, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're going to be successful in, 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 in being a tool that you use every day, almost all day, that's hard. That's not easy. It cannot suck. If it sucks, uh, you're not going to survive much longer. I think here in 2023, 20, building an app is almost the easy part, but getting people to download it, ensuring that it's user-friendly, it's secure, it ticks the compliance box, and it's stable. Uh, these are all the things that are much, much harder to achieve. So on this side of things, can you tell me a little bit more about why analytics are so crucial to, to the marketing of a mobile app? I don't believe in, in random actions. I don't believe that the someone is falling on his phone and accidentally installing the booking.com app yeah. or any other game. Like my child told me, hey, accidentally I touched it and he downloaded this game. Uh, yeah. So I think that once app developers understand their customers, understand where their profitable customers are coming from, and then they can make decisions based on return on investment. So they can, we know if they invest $1 here, what is going to be the predicted result of that? Uh, without guessing it, they can check themselves. They can verify that this is if this is reality or not. So once you have robust data that you can rely on, this is the difference. If you have data that is inaccurate, you cannot make decisions based on that. And if you do, you basically can be doomed. Why? Because you might think that you invest $1 and get $2 out of it after two weeks or two months or two years or half a year, and you don't see the return because what? The measurement was wrong. There was fraudulent activity going on. So you thought you are going to get the return. You see the return in the analytics, but in the end of the day, you check the bank account the money doesn't come in because bots are not paying your bills. Because what, you thought that this is organic traffic, you thought now it's attributed to paid campaigns, but it's not. So the bottom line in terms of revenue is staying the same, you just increased your budget, you increased your expenses without really knowing that you're killing yourself. And everything goes right, and like in total, you have infinite amount of budget and the interest rate is zero, cost of money is nothing, okay. Measurement is important. This is how we make decisions. But now it's becoming critical. With scrutiny on budgets, if you let's say if you try to save budget on, on the measurement tools, you can use the you can lose the entire company. Why? You might continue to make decisions that makes us, hey, that's very profitable. We invest one dollar and we get two dollars out of it. That's no brainer. You give you give me more money. Yeah. Uh, and then you find out this is wrong. And this is why accuracy is critical in general and critical for us and critical for app developers in general. But it's not only, it's not limited to apps because right now we kind of expanded that uh, to kind of any ch channel and any platform. So it's not only mobile application, it can be web, it can be CTV, it can be gaming consoles, it can be different platforms. And I think that this is what we found that what we've been building for the last oh, 10 years for the environment without cookies, now it's becoming kind of a reality for all the other platforms, right? So that I just mentioned. And you have cross-platform verticals like gaming, so you gaming consoles and you have mobile and you have PC and you have three streaming. It can be CTV, it can be phone, it can be desktop. And you have various services 
uh, that need to be able to measure the entire funnel. So the funnel can start from mobile and then end on your TV or start in your TV and then on your mobile or any other kind of complexity around devices. And the question is, how do we enable data uh, analytics and insights to allow these companies to make the right decisions for them? So it's not only the application. We have some, we have actually a lot of companies that are mobile first and mobile only. So that's simple, right? Yeah. So basically, after it's everything for them. It's the CRM, it's the analytics, it's everything. Because they don't have mobile, they don't have web, they don't have any other platform, they have only mobile. So that's it. They integrate AppSmart, that's it. They have 10,000 different partners that they can work with. They have the entire world accessible from that platform and measured from that platform. Once you get into this kind of complexity, I think that we have as an industry a long way to go and to, in answering, in the end of the day, simple questions. What should I do next? Should I invest in my next dollar? I think that this is not solved yet. Actually, in, in a way, it's really moving in some areas backwards with the new privacy regulations and changes that adding more complexity into the measurement era. And you've seen so many changes in the last 20 years. And I'm curious, if you were to look forward, would kind of big changes do you see happening across the tech landscape that could impact the industry next year, five years, 10 years from now? Is, are there any trends that you're seeing forming there around big changes? Yeah, I think that I will mention two. Yeah. One, privacy changes and regulation. I think that what we are seeing in the last couple of years, specifically in the last three years, is just the beginning of a really big movement of privacy. I'm not going to talk even about cons what's the end result for consumers. This is deserves a separate discussion. So it's a long discussion and a complex one. But if I'm just focus on what it means to the industry, it means one thing, changes, a lot of changes, massive changes that will require companies to completely redo and rethink everything that they're doing. And I think that this is a challenge for the entire digital ecosystem. Big parts of what we do is so solving the challenges for the ecosystem. And I think that was kind of, we had the Coney as a company three years ago. So when Apple introduced the iOS 14 back in 2000, June to 2020, they introduced iOS 14, they introduced the AT, Tracking Transparency and the SK Network, we got hundreds, if not thousands of phone calls from our customers and partners that were really scared to death. They thought that this is really the end of their world because they're not going to have the data so they can make decisions, basically many of them. So a uh, huge challenge, challenges, and they just on calling us and asking us for solutions and what are we going to do and this and that. So we really had an amazing calling back then. And we set our, basically we have, we had that kind of evolution to our vision and to entirely look at the ecosystem and for the benefit of the ecosystem with our vision to have a better and safer digital experience for consumers. So we are a B2B company serving consumer-based company. So we said to ourselves, if we want to deliver great products to our customers, we need to look at their own customers and build the privacy-preserving technology that will allow our, company, our customers and partners to basically work with each other and provide the same level of user experience and value delivered to consumers back enhancing privacy. The philosophy that we are not a regulator. We cannot go to the market and say, hey, now from now on, you're not going to have this and this because this is good for consumer privacy. We are not in that position and no one is going to buy this technology. Why? Why do they need to buy the technology that will completely not, uh, not allow them to do whatever? So we really forced ourselves into building new form of technology that will allow to enhance in a significant way privacy and continue to
to provide the insight, the data analytics, customers, our customers, consumer-based companies and partners, the ecosystem will be able to get the insights and get the data they need in order to make decisions. This is how we introduced a year after we introduced the privacy cloud and the data clean rule. Since then you had every day you have a new announcement for another data clean room, which is great. But really the data clean room philosophy is to allow two companies or more to collaborate in a trusted environment. So both of them can put data, analyze both data sets, and no one is can access the other party user level data. That's magical because it really allows two companies to have the same level of insights, the same level of data analytics, just without exchanging the user level data between themselves. I can go on or not. If you really think about Omnet um, and Momo, which is built on cookies and yep. identifiers in the mobile. So this is, this, uh, this is probably the most, one of the most links URLs. This is the most elementary building block of the internet and mobile ecosystem. So the only way for companies to work with each other was to work based on thinking cookies and identifiers. Yeah. We don't have another form of technology to allow companies to work with each other without exchanging your data. And this is something that we introduced. This is something that we introduced in 20, in 2020 and 2021. By the way, privacy was always, always in front of our eyes because this is not the first privacy change. So we said to ourselves, we need to lead that change. And there were a lot of changes before. I was, I was 14 is a big one. But the application of UDID, if people remember, and then the introduction of the IDFA, light devices, and many, many GDPR, SPA, so many other things. And now we are really thinking that on the privacy era, I think that it's going to change how the digital ecosystem that I said, measurement, privacy preserving measurement, and I didn't even talk about the cryptographic solutions for active collaboration, zero trust, like homomorphic encryption and private set intersection that really allow to do and analyze da encrypted data while encrypted. It sounds magical, it's doable on the smaller data sets and the bigger data sets. Now it's very challenging. That on the privacy side, I also believe that the way Enterprise software is going to be delivered in the future is going to change. Yeah. Uh, I believe that, and this is really big part of the vision for the privacy cloud, to allow companies to bring services and logic into their own data instead of sending the data into the logic or to the service. Basically, there is no data movement. You can build new logic and bring third-party logic that sits in your data. We already have the data. We already have the 10,000 partners. So this is basically already happening, maybe the beginning of it. I think that I have no doubt. And the second thing that connects to the first one, you asked me what the changes and prediction in the future. Yeah. Privacy, more scrutiny on data. On the other end, which is kind of contradicting, is AI. AI, we can talk about forever, but let's, I, in my view, I hope that I'm not uh, confusing listeners too much <laughs> because we're talking about a lot of stuff. AI, in my opinion, is an iPhone moment, the same iPhone moment we had in 2007, just much, much, much bigger and faster to impact. And it's also hidden. Why it's hidden? With the introduction on the iPhone, you had the device. You can buy the device. And look at the device and understand for yourself. And this is what happened to me. By the way, my first iPhone was in the US. It was really hard to buy one in, the, in Israel. By the way, I didn't believe that iPhone or Apple is going to be successful building a new phone that is better than BlackBerry. Yeah, that yeah. <laughs> we always fast forward AI going to change everything about everything. This is, this is, it's going, maybe it's going to take a little less time, maybe a little more time. It is going to change every, everything to the fact that. I think in maybe a couple of years, maybe five years, the way we interact and access digital ecosystems. Now, what is the internet? So now you can access the internet through web browser or through app stores, through an application. I think that you're going to have much bigger interface 
in a in an ecosystem that is not yet built. But what I wanted to say about AI is that AI cannot live in a silo. AI needs data, a lot of data, and historical data. Mm. Now, how does it work with the basic, most elementary privacy requirement and principle? I'm not even talking about GDPR and CCPA. Basic elementary privacy principle, which is data minimization. On one hand, you have data minimization, more scrutiny on the data. This is change number one. But change number two, number two requires a lot more data, a lot more data. <laughs> and the question is, AI needs all the data? What? Half a year history is not enough. Maybe you need two years, three years, two months, two hours. What is minimum? Yeah. What I'm saying, zero is the minimum. Because if you can run the logic in your data, in your privacy cloud, in that, so that the data doesn't leave, you have zero. Yeah. So this is the only way that these two big movements can live together. You have data scrutiny, no data movement, the data cannot leave and travel across companies, or you have you you have to have minimum, and from other than another existential threat for everybody, AI that needs a lot of data. Yeah, and this is what we want to solve with the privacy cloud. And I think everyone listening will agree that understanding privacy is crucial to marketers in mobile app usage. It's a huge topic. The big question I've got to ask, though, how does protecting a user's privacy, how does that impact the user experience? Are there any sacrifices there? Look, I, if we're talking about consumers, we need to have a separate podcast because it's going to be not professional for me because I think that for consumer privacy it is misunderstood. Yeah. And the way we're thinking about it, cookies, not cookies, and identifiers, not identifiers, and all that kind of stuff is really making, not making a good judgment and call for consumers. Think about, in the end of the day, as consumer, you ask yourself, uh, the things that you perceive as private, are they really private? Yeah. When you're getting into a meeting room, two people close the door, you would, we would want to think that this is private, but you have cameras, you have microphone, is that something is on, is it? computer recording it and analyzing it, what's happening with that data that you perceive as private. You have security cameras. You have, again, you're walking around with phone and microphones and cameras. Only a year and a half ago, you started to have an indication on your iPhone and Android device, I believe, if the camera is on or not, if the microphone is on or not. So these kind of messages that you communicate with, I don't know, with your family, et cetera, et cetera, are they really private? Can someone read them in, in between? Not someone. It's nothing even a person. If it's a machine, it's even worse because it's scaled. So what I'm trying to say that consumer privacy is something that is very complex. People tend to get into the, hey, I look for shoes and then I see shoes all over the website. Yeah. Yes, it's bothering. But the things that are much more bothering, and not to mention secure safety. When I'm saying safety, I'm talking about the children's safety. I'm talking about children regulation. And how do you make sure that applications or any service that is dictated or directed to children, you make sure that the children are safe? And I have news to everybody. They are not safe. Completely not safe. I see that here. We have also personal stories. It's really bad. So this is why I don't want to get into consumer and talk about the surface that everybody is talking about because it's much deeper. It's much, much deeper. Maybe we, it's really out of scope, but I think that uh, children are not safe. Privacy, you can have a lot of debate about the real things that people might think that are private. But in general, our scope, by the way, safety is also one of our, part of our vision. And, but we don't have products. Safety, I'm not I'm talking about children's safety. Yeah, But we are active on the community and education part for parents and supporting different technologies to solve it. It's a big problem. I think that the world really developed in the, amazingly in the last 10 years and mobile devices and services and social networks. But I think that we need to have maybe a couple of more years to solve or to make sure that it's not risking us to want, because it is, it's a major impact on people's lives. 
Yeah. I was reading, I think it was about five years ago, that executives at Facebook were caught bragging to a marketing agency that they knew the exact moment that a, a 12, 13-year-old girl was feeling low, had low self-esteem, needed a pick-me-up, and they could give an advert at the exact right time without realising how creepy they were sounding. It is a huge topic and one maybe we could revisit in the future. But right now, I mean, what's next for Apps Flyer? Anything you can share about the road ahead for you guys? Yeah, definitely. So I measure the privacy cloud and data cleanroom. I think that we're really in an intersection of data scrutiny, data privacy, and how do you leverage AI and AI technologies and in general services that the data is not moving. And this is something that we are working on. Uh, that's basically it. Privacy preserving measurement, privacy preserving technologies, zero trust, zero trust, privacy preserving technologies. So all that kind of stuff. Sometimes it's, uh, it's together. Look, if you're talking about our data set, it's not data, it's not sensitive. We don't have health uh, information or financial information and stuff like that. We don't have emails and stuff like that. So some data, and in this data, so for some customers, it's more important this data set than this data set. So in terms of the zero trust and cryptographic solutions or, or privacy enhancing technologies, for some data sets, you can apply that to part of the data set and not only all the data sets. Now we're getting into too much details. But yeah, it's fun. I think that we, I think that in the digital ecosystem, specifically for us, I mean that, look, for everybody, this is probably the most dynamic industry ever created by, by humans. And by definition, in order for you to survive, not to be successful, to survive, you need to be extremely adaptive and to be able to build plans and then change the plans completely and build and dump technologies and build new technologies. And I think that this is what we're trying to be the best at. So we're also trying to really fall in love with the problem, but even bigger, we really fell in love with the industry. We fell in love with our customers. We fell in love with our partners. We fell in love with the platforms, including the big platforms. And we thought that in order for us to solve the, you have Different amount of solutions in order to solve one problem. Now, if we don't, and this is something that I, told, I tell the team always don't fall in love with your own ideas, don't fall in love with your own product. Because once you do that, you are doomed. Tomorrow, it's going to be different. By definition, it's going to be different. Now, if you fall in love with your, it's, you can consider that as a baby, you, but it's really hard. It's your baby, you created it. But you always need to think if this is the end of that. Baby, yeah. maybe you need to have a different solution to solve the same problem. And if we are going to be one of the, and I know that it's not the company that will have the best technology or whatever it is, the company that will be most, and this is the company that will be the most adapted. Or the, I forgot the name, uh, Charles Darwin said that a while ago, but it, this is really applicable to today's, and especially given very challenging years that we had in an in, as an industry, very challenging years since 2020, and uh, we are continue, we will continue to have very challenging years in the coming years. For us, and this is something that I say here, and I say to our customers and partners, we take that as our mission. We take that as our mission to provide privacy preserving technologies and measurement to allow the ecosystem, this amazing ecosystem to continue to strive. I think that's a very powerful moment to end on. But before I do let you go, there's so many different URLs, et cetera, out there at the moment. For anyone listening, wanting to find out a bit more information about AppsFly, the kind of work that you do, how you can help businesses, what's the best starting point for everything? It's a good one. I don't think that, well, we have a website, but you know, I I have my, well, it sounds like self-promoting, but I have a blog post. Yeah. Once in a while, I write my thoughts. Yeah. The problem is that I have more thoughts than writing <laughs> ability. And the, the last post that I had, I had that on my to-do list for more than a year, talking about regulators and their job, basically. And I had that on my to-do list, I had some bullet points. And as soon as ChatGPT, that was December of last year, ChatGPT 3, I think, it was the first version 
of ChatGTP. I logged in. By the way, I had a Google Moon. The day that I heard Google search, and it was 23 years ago, I had the same moment with ChatGTP. Yeah. And same day, same day, I sat on my chair for two hours and I wrote the entire blog post and I published it. Wow. It was mind blowing. It was an experience that on that day I said, this is so big that we cannot even imagine the implications of it in so many ways, in so many ways. But anyways, the blog post is out there really days after the introduction of chat and is out, it's out there and some other things that really shaped us as a company. For example, a customer obsession. I mean, so we put the customers at the front of everything we do. This is how we kind of, this company, how it was created. So when we started to work in the company, we had zero idea about marketing and apps and digital and the internet. But when we started to build technology and we said to ourselves, let's just find some customers and just build the tech, the product that they need. Just let's put ourselves in their shoes and try to build their technology and service. So, and then it was an amazing market fit for us for many years up until today. And we said to ourselves, look, maybe I do not have experience being a CEO of 100 employees, 500 employees, 1,000 employees, 1,500 employees. But I do know that we have an amazing market fit. So if I will have the part of the culture, the company culture will be Customer is the most important thing, the most important thing. We're going to die for our customers. We're probably going to be able to do so, something really good because once you develop a software that is so crucial to, to our customers that they use it every day and you de develop such an intimate relationship with our customers, I think that you just need to not forget what took you here which are the customers. I also refer to the customers as our first investors. We had a very hard time to raise money at the beginning. So really our investors were our customers, that the ones, not the ones that paid, the ones that were willing to suffer us and take the journey with us. And this, and I just wrote it down a couple of years ago, this blog post, and it really became a fundamental part of the company. So that's another one. Another. I think that another one that is related to it, really something that influenced uh, me from the beginning almost, was delivering the book of Delivering Happiness. I think that I mentioned that yeah. uh, in the blog post, uh, Delivering Happiness of Tony Shane you know, of Apple's uh, Rest in Peace. So, uh, he really influenced me in, in us as a company for so many reasons. It's very different companies. But I thought that at the end of the day, these are people, and I thought that and it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> well, if you can send me a link to that, I will uh, add a link to that blog post and a link to your website so people listening can find you nice and easy. We covered so much in a short amount of time, and there's still so much more that we could talk about, so we'll have to get you on later in the year to expand on some of those other areas. But just a big thank you for sharing your story today. Thank you, Neil. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And that's a wrap on today's conversation with the CEO and co-founder of AppsFlyer. And there's so many big takeaways from the conversation for me, especially around why accurate data is essential for effective decision-making in the mobile app marketing space. And the importance of independent and unbiased measurement companies such as AppsFlyer and the critical role that they play in providing trust and transparency within the entire ecosystem. And of course, privacy changes and regulations have a significant impact on that ecosystem too. And there's no avoiding this. Adapting to these changes with privacy-preserving technologies is vital for businesses to remain both competitive and compliant. And we're also approaching that intersection of data privacy and AI. It's a ripe area for innovation right now. But if we put the tech to one side, company culture is going to play a significant role in the success of business. And staying adaptable and agile in the face of these tremendous challenges is going to be crucial for the long-term success of every business, I would imagine. For me, it was an incredibly fascinating and thought-provoking discussion. And I hope you gain a little valuable insight that you can apply to your own journey and the world of technology. But 
Thanks for tuning in as always to Tech Talks Daily. Keep your messages coming in to me at techblogwriteroutlook.com. I look forward to bringing you more conversations like this with industry leaders in the days, weeks, months and years ahead. So until next time, stay curious, keep exploring this incredible world of technology. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you.